Recently on our channel and media platforms, the most frequently asked questions have been, why aren't Melbourne's housing prices going up? Will Melbourne's housing prices start rising in the second half of the year? Is it still worth buying a property in Melbourne now? Should I sell my Melbourne property at a loss to invest in Brisbane or Perth instead? Melbourne's housing prices have dropped to the fourth lowest in Australia. Even Brisbane, with only half the population of Melbourne, is more expensive. If the current trend continues, by October this year, the average house prices in Perth, with a population of about 3 million, and Adelaide, with a population of 1.5 million, will also surpass Melbourne. Melbourne's housing prices will then rank third from the bottom among Australia's eight cities. As Australia's second largest city, Melbourne is a vibrant metropolis that has consistently ranked among the world's most livable cities. It boasts a rich cultural scene, top schools, and a diverse population. So why aren't the housing prices going up? Who is suitable to buy a property in Melbourne and who should avoid it? When will the Melbourne housing market finally see a comeback? Hi, I'm Alex. Welcome to Oz Property Strategy, where I share information about real estate investment, economic trends, and wealth creation. If you like this video, smash the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell to watch new weekly videos. Without further ado, let's get into it. Starting from March 2020, when the pandemic began, Sydney's house prices have increased by 28%. Brisbane by 61%, Adelaide by 64%, and Perth by 66%, while Melbourne's prices have only risen by 11.2%. From its peak in March 2022, Melbourne's housing market had seen a 3.9% decline over the past two and a half years. Although there was a slight upward trend starting in February 2023, this upward momentum weakened by May of the same year, leading to a 15-month stagnation. In recent months, Melbourne's housing prices have fluctuated within the range of plus or minus 0.3%, with the current median price at 783000 The Melbourne housing market has been lagging for the last two years, moving slower than a turtle. However, some may ask, with the same population growth and an increasing number of immigrants, why are other cities experiencing price increases while Melbourne isn't? To understand this, we've conducted extensive research combined with first-hand market data and our understanding of Australian policies and economic conditions to provide a detailed analysis. Before we begin the analysis, we need to establish some premises. Firstly, when I mention Melbourne's house prices, I refer to the overall Melbourne market, encompassing all regions and all property types price changes. Although the overall market performance is poor, individual properties may perform exceptionally well or worse. Secondly, our analysis does not constitute investment advice. If you make investment decisions based on our show's content and lose money, don't blame us. And if you make money, you don't need to share it with us. Just be responsible for your own actions. When analyzing the housing price trends within a specific region, such as nationwide, statewide, in the greater Melbourne area, or even a suburb, the fundamental and direct determinant is the balance between supply and demand. All prices are determined by the comparison of these two forces. If demand is greater, prices will rise. If supply is greater, prices will fall. This is the free market mechanism. Various factors determine their respective strengths on both the supply and demand sides. No single factor can determine house prices alone. Some say that falling interest rates will cause house prices to rise. Is that true? Some say that prices will rebound from a trough. Is that true? Will it rebound in a year or 10 years? This entire knowledge system was established at the inception of our channel. If you had watched our videos from the beginning, you've never have asked this question. Based on the data collected from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and CoreLogic, we have created models to analyze various factors affecting house prices, and the conclusion is consistent. No single factor can determine the rise or fall of house prices because there are counterexamples for every factor. We will analyze the most important factors on both the supply and demand sides to understand why Melbourne's house prices aren't rising and when they might start to grow. Melbourne is Australia's second largest city by population, following Sydney. Like Sydney, only a tiny portion of Melbourne's population growth is due to natural births, and a small part is due to interstate migration, which can sometimes be positive and sometimes negative, depending on the economic situations and policies, making it quite unstable. The most stable factor is international migration. In 2023, Victoria saw 26,600 natural births and 160,200 international migrants, similar to New South Wales. It's important to note that when the Bureau of Statistics calculates international migration, they include all people holding Australian visas that allow them to stay for 12 months or more, as well as those who have already stayed in Australia for more than 12 months. 
This includes permanent immigrants, medium to long-term work visas, working holiday visas, student visas, and those who can extend their visas onshore, all of which count as international migrants. Victoria experienced a net interstate migration loss of 275 people, meaning it was losing its population in this part. At this point, you may conclude that population growth doesn't necessarily lead to higher housing prices. In terms of population growth rate, Victoria increased by 2.8% in 2023, surpassing Sydney's 2.2%. You may ask, if Melbourne's population growth rate is higher than Sydney's, why are Sydney's housing prices increasing while Melbourne's aren't? This is because the overall strength of demand in Sydney is relatively higher. Having money is essential for the demand side. One major factor determining whether a family can buy a house is how much money they have. While the Bureau of Statistics doesn't have any data on this, it can be inferred from other data indicating the pressure on household expenditures. Discretionary spending such as travel, shopping, dining at fancy restaurants, and leisure activities contrasts with non-discretionary spending such as mortgage payments, utility bills, and basic living expenses. The more discretionary spending a household has, the more it reflects their consumption capacity or wealth. According to the Bureau of Statistics, discretionary spending for Victorian households decreased by 1% in December 2023 compared to a year earlier, while New South Wales saw a 1.8% decline. By May 2024, Victoria's discretionary spending had decreased by 2.1% compared to a year earlier, and New South Wales had decreased by 3%. It appears that people in New South Wales are more willing to tighten their belts and reduce discretionary spending, while Victorians are less inclined to do so, reflecting that Victorians are less likely to save money for investment during difficult times, which objectively reduces their ability to buy houses. Loan amounts and interest rates are discussed together because they are closely linked. Generally, as interest rates rise, the amount a person can borrow decreases. For example, some earning $100,000 a year might be able to borrow $700,000 when the variable mortgage rate is 3%, but only $500,000 when the rate rises to 6%. These figures are illustrative and may not be accurate. Currently, the Reserve Bank of Australia's rate is 4.35%, with variable mortgage rates for owner-occupied homes around 6%. Since the rate hike cycle began over two years ago, we are now at the peak of Australian interest rates, making it significantly harder to obtain loans. This has reduced purchasing power, naturally lowering demand. For the property buyers, if the government offers more favorable policies, people are more likely to buy houses. It is straightforward. However, what policies does Victoria currently have to stimulate home purchases? For local Australians without homes or money, they can buy a house with a 5% deposit, leveraging to the max, but the application conditions are very stringent. First home buyers purchasing new properties under $750,000 are rewarded with $10,000. There are some stamp duty concessions, but they come with many conditions. This money isn't easy to get. Victoria has the highest stamp duty in Australia, and foreign buyers have to pay an additional 8% stamp duty surcharge. Frankly, I don't see the Victorian government strongly incentivizing people to buy houses through fiscal subsidies. On the contrary, it seems they give a little reluctantly, but they don't reduce the amount of money they need to collect. Thus, the demand isn't very strong. Except for population growth, everything else is a negative factor. Now let's take a look at the supply side. For second-hand homes, as of May 2024, over the past 12 months, the sale to new listing ratio of Melbourne properties is 0.9. This means for every 10 new listings, only 9 were sold. The supply is very high. In the 12 months period, 98,000 properties were newly listed for sale, while only 84,000 were sold, leading to an increasing inventory. In terms of new home supply, Melbourne is not lagging behind. As of May 2024, house approvals increased by 1.4% compared to Sydney's 0.3%, with Melbourne approving 1,000 more houses than Sydney. For apartment and townhouse approvals, Melbourne saw a 1.9% increase, while Sydney had a 1.5% increase, meaning Melbourne approved 500 more units than Sydney. Therefore, Melbourne's new house supply is relatively higher than Sydney's. Loan amounts and interest rates are both demand-side and supply-side factors. A rising interest rate increased the repayment pressure on property owners. Although rents are also rising, Melbourne's current rental yield is the second lowest in the country at only 3.6%. Compared to a 6% interest rate, negative cash flow is almost inevitable. 
Therefore, landlords with worsening financial situations have a higher incentive to list their properties for sale, directly increasing the supply of properties on the market. Although low rental returns are not unique to Melbourne, while well, Sydney faces a similar situation, Sydney hasn't seen a wave of investment property sell-offs. This difference is directly related to Melbourne's policies and taxes, which place additional burdens on investors, making it difficult for them to breathe. The cost of holding a property in Melbourne is increasing, with council rates, water charges, property management fees, strata, land tax, land tax surcharges, vacancy taxes, and more, totaling over 10 different taxes and fees. Melbourne undoubtedly has the highest property holding costs in Australia. After the Victorian government's May 2023 budget, which aimed to repay debts accumulated during the pandemic with a 10-year repayment plan, the government is targeting property investors, resulting in even more tax increases. Five new taxes were added for property investors, including the lowest land tax threshold in Australia at only 50000 This means even a cheap investment apartment might start incurring land tax. For those already paying land tax, the costs have significantly increased. Additionally, Victorian laws protecting tenants have become stricter, preventing landlords from easily evicting tenants or raising rents. All these factors reduce the profitability and increase the losses for property investors, with the missing profit ending up in Victorian government's pockets. Well, it's no wonder that Victorian investment properties are as undesirable as rotten cabbage. We advised our Vision members to exit the Victorian investment property market starting in May 2023, right after the new budget was introduced, even though the market was still rising back then. This move has proven to be correct. The supply-side forces in Victoria are overwhelming, with more new homes being built and more second-hand homes being listed for sale compared to other states. And given the weak demand-side factors, it's natural that property prices in Victoria haven't risen. In fact, I'm quite surprised that prices haven't significantly dropped over the past year. Now that we understand why Victorian property prices are where they are, will they rise in the future? The most reliable method for assessing the market situation is to consistently monitor the balance of supply and demand. However, because there are so many factors, people may not have the time to observe comprehensively and in real time as we do. So here are a few tips for everyone to consider. The simplest method is to look at auction clearance rates. If the clearance rate is rising continuously, it indicates a hot market. Generally, a clearance rate of around 75% suggests a balanced market and over 80% typically signifies a seller's market, where you will see significant price increases. This is the direct result of supply and demand. However, the problem is that the clearance rate is a lagging indicator. You only see it after the events have occurred. By the time you realize this and stop preparing for a loan and looking for a house, it might take at least three months, during which time you could miss out on some price increases and pay more than originally anticipated. But the advantage is you can still buy early in the new market cycle. Interest rates are also an indicator reflecting the balance of supply and demand. A decrease in interest rates means buyers can borrow more money and pay less interest, reducing the cost of owning a property and thus increasing the willingness and budget to buy a house. At the same time, lower interest rates reduce interest payments, lessen landlords' holding costs, ease their pressure, increase yield, and reduce the urgency to sell properties, decreasing supply. This rise in demand and drop in supply naturally help boost housing prices. Interest rates are a leading indicator, allowing us to anticipate price trends. However, like all leading indicators, there is a probability of error, because historically, there have been both positive and negative correlations between interest rates and housing prices. A comprehensive judgment based on other factors is necessary. Policies are also a leading indicator because the market reacts only after policies are implemented. Imagine if the government supports home buyers by providing money or reducing taxes. These measures can stimulate specific market segments. For example, better first home buyer policies can help more people enter the property market. Reducing land tax can boost investor confidence, stop sell-offs, and even prompt more investment property purchases. Favorable immigrant policies can lead to a surge in immigrants and students coming to Melbourne. These are the signals of a rising property market. Of course, I think the biggest signal would be that the Victorian Labour Party is replaced by another party focused more on economic development to fundamentally address Victoria's economic problems. But why is the Labour Party elected? Because many people in Victoria support the Labour Party, even if it makes Victoria poorer. And why? When Labour comes to power, it hands out various subsidies and lowers housing prices, which are naturally popular for most people who don't have money or a house. 
However, this sacrifices overall economic efficiency, burdening Victoria as an economic entity with heavy debts. Eventually, every Victorian resident bears the burden. But people don't care. They'd rather enjoy the moment and vote for the Liberal Party later when everyone is poor. Then the Liberal Party will help people make money, increase the wealth gap, and see house prices rise, and then the cycle repeats itself. This situation in Victoria is the result of millions of people's actions combined, and I don't think this pattern will change in the future. The booming luxury property market is almost always the clearest signal of a major housing market uptrend in any Australian city. We have observed this many times in the past. When the economy is good and business is flourishing, it naturally creates a group of wealthy individuals who are the fastest to react. When they have money, what do they do? In Australia, they buy houses. And then you hear news about the booming luxury property market. Whenever I hear such news, my first reaction is to check the economic, trade and employment data because business owners are getting rich first, creating new jobs and contributing to the economy. This prosperity gradually trickles down to the middle class and then to the lower class. Generally, the broader property market starts rising three to six months after the luxury property market boom. So when will the Melbourne property market start to rise? Simply put, I don't know. I hope it starts rising tomorrow, but that's unlikely because the factors determining the supply-demand balance have stayed the same. The first opportunity I see is when Australia cuts interest rates, but given the current situation, the first rate cut might not happen until next year. After discussing so much, is it worth buying a property in Melbourne now? It depends on your situation. If you only want to buy a home to live in and don't care about appreciation, you can buy now. Melbourne has been in the flat market for a while and it's currently a buyer's market. So you might be able to negotiate a good price. Whether the property price is increasing is not as important if you plan to live there for at least 15 years. If you want to buy a home to live in and need it to increase in price, you can still buy now. However, you should purchase the most expensive house you can afford and plan to hold it for at least 15 years. While Melbourne may not see significant short-term growth, it's likely to appreciate in the long term. If you plan to upgrade to a bigger or better located home after its price increases, consider how soon you want to move. If you aim to upgrade within two to three years, don't buy in Melbourne, as prices might not increase quickly. Instead, invest in other states to make money, then sell or refinance to buy a better home in Melbourne later. If you aim to invest in multiple properties for financial freedom, our Vision membership can help. When building an investment portfolio, you need high appreciation properties to quickly extract equity and buy more properties, expanding your portfolio rapidly. This strategy is not suitable for Melbourne. As price increases are slow, it's better to invest in other states. If you're nearing retirement and want to buy a property for rental income and high cash flow, the Vision membership can assist with this in a later phase of the membership. The goal is to achieve financial freedom and retire with rental income. This strategy also doesn't suit Melbourne. Perth or Brisbane are better due to higher rental yields. However, some of Melbourne's unique houses, such as at the lakeside, can be used for short-term rentals, offering 1.5 to 3 times the return of long-term rentals. Lately, if you've been looking for a property in Melbourne, you've likely heard agents say, it's the bottom of the market and prices are about to rise, urging you to buy quickly. This widespread claim has flooded the market, persuading those who are uncertain or unaware of the market trends. This theory has many issues. Number one, how do you know it's the bottom? There's a chance something could cause Melbourne's property prices to fall further, such as Victorian government imposing additional taxes, which they've done multiple times in the past year and a half. Or Victoria's universities might suddenly lose international students due to the change in federal immigration policies, which is currently a hot topic. Number two, how long will this bottom last? The housing market in almost every Australian city has experienced prolonged flat periods. From 2009 to 2016, Perth, Hobart, Darwin, Adelaide and Brisbane all had flat markets. Even Sydney's growth from 2008 to 2012 was negligible. Who can guarantee this won't happen in Melbourne? Number 3. Will Melbourne rebound quickly or slowly? If Melbourne's market rebounds, will it be a gradual or rapid rise? When will it start and how long will it last? No one can answer these questions. If someone claims to, they are likely a fraud. The property market isn't a place for quick profits. Your hope for price increases has no impact on whether they actually happen. Staying calm, focusing on the market, and thinking long-term to earn stable returns is always the best strategy. If you made it this far, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe, and share this with your friends. Turn on the notification bell to watch new weekly videos, and have a good one. Bye.